Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Sentinel Lymph Node Mapping Using Near-Infrared Fluorescence in Gastric Cancer. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce your speaker of today, Dr. Danny Sherwinter. Dr. Sherwinter is the Director of Minimally Invasive and Bariatric Surgery at the Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. In addition, he is the Program Director of the Maimonides Advanced GI Minimally Invasive Surgery Fellowship Program. Dr. Sherwinter is the recipient of multiple research grants and is widely published in the peer-reviewed literature. He has authored multiple book chapters and has presented his work at both national and international meetings. He has been interviewed by the New York Times for his expertise. Under his leadership, the Division of Bariatric Weight Loss Surgery at Maimonides received the Bariatric Center of Excellence designation from the SRC and has obtained MBSA QRP accreditation from the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Sherwinter is also a surgical innovator, having been involved in some of the pioneering work into the benefits of near-infrared angiography, cholangiography for prevention of anastomatic leak, and bile duct injury, respectively. Dr. Sherwinder is also the holder of multiple patents in both the US and abroad. And now, without any further ado, over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, good morning. I'd like to thank everyone taking the time to be here today and especially I'd like to thank the ISFGS and Dr. Dip and Rosenthal specifically for inviting me today to give this webinar. I'd also like to thank Diagnostic Green for their ongoing support of the ISFGS. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Uh, we'll be talking today about sentinel lymph node mapping using near-infrared fluorescence in gastric cancer. Um, I don't have any disclosures related to this talk. Um, so gastric cancer is the second leading worldwide cause of cancer death, the fifth most common cancer with over 1 million new cases estimated to occur each year, nearly half of those cases occurring in Eastern Asia. This is the most recent SEER database here in the United States, uh, which shows that 28% of cases are localized, 29% um, are regional, which is that they have uh, spread to the regional lymph nodes, and 36% uh, are metastatic. Um, from a five-year survival standpoint, you see here uh, 68%, 60, about 69% five-year survival for the localized cases, 31% five-year survival for the regional cases, and 5.3% uh, for the distant metastatic cases, highlighting the importance of accurate staging, specifically lymph node staging. A fundamental aspect and decades-long controversy has swirled around the recommended extent of lymphadenectomy for gastric cancer. Gastric resection with associated lymph nodes has been the mainstay worldwide, but a more extensive resection of more central nodes was pioneered by the Japanese. This more complete lymphadenectomy is referred to as the D2 lymphadenectomy. Performing a D2 lymphadenectomy is more technically demanding and has been shown to cat uh, has, and had been slow to catch on in Western centers. This was mainly due to a number of published reports indicating an increased morbidity and mortality with D2 lymphadenectomy without an oncologic benefit. The Dutch D1-D2 study reported on the five-year outcomes and showed a statistically significant increase in postoperative morbidity of 43% in the D2 group versus 4% in the D1 group and a mortality of 10% in the D2 group versus 4% in the D1 group. All of this while showing no difference in the five-year survival between the groups. These findings were also seen in the MRC and the Italian studies, which led most Western surgeons to believe that the increased morbidity and mortality of D2 lymphadenectomy was not warranted. 
More recently, it has become evident that this increased risk was overblown and was more related to the pancreatectomy and splenectomy performed in those studies and lack of expertise with the technique. With increasing experience in Western centers, it is clear that D2 lymphadenectomy has a much more acceptable risk profile. Furthermore, in the recently published 15-year results of the Dutch study, they showed that the overall 15-year survival was 21% for the D1 group and 29% for the D2 group, so not that different. But when we looked at gastric cancer-related death rate, this was significantly higher in the D1 group, which was 48%, compared to the D2 group, which was 37%. Also, local recurrence was 22% in the D1 group versus only 12% in the D2 group, further confirming the oncologic benefits of the more complete D2 lymphadenectomy. A D2 lymphadenectomy, though, does come with an increased morbidity, and the benefits of the oncologic improvement need to be weighed against those risks. <clears throat> Some of the risks of uh, D2 lymphadenectomy include bleeding, pancreatitis, subdiaphragmatic abscesses, lymphorrhea, and chylocystitis. This becomes of particular importance when we look at early stage cancer being that early stage cancer has a metastatic lymph node rate of only 9%, and a D2 lymphadenectomy is probably overly aggressive for these patients, 91% of patients. Um, this has been the driving force behind the rise in interest in sentinel, nodes, sentinel node dissection to try to identify those patients who do not benefit from a complete D2. Sentinel node dissection could potentially save those patients from the morbidity and mortality of this extensive dissection while not compromising the oncologic outcomes. This effort began almost 30 years ago, again, spearheaded by the Japanese. Many of the original studies attempted to use a technique similar to the highly successful and clinically important sentinel lymph node dissection of breast cancer or melanoma. This is referred to as the pickup method and involves performing an intraoperative identification of the sentinel node or nodes, usually one to four nodes, then an analysis with intraoperative frozen section. In any of those sentinel no if any of those sentinel nodes showed disease, a more radical lymphadenectomy was undertaken. Although so, some studies seem to support this concept and showed good detection rate and high sensitivity, there was a huge amount of variability in these reported results. I put this systematic review up as an example where they included studies reporting a sensitivity of only 40% and detection rates as low as 54%. This review in the World Journal of Gastroenterology showed more homogeneity of results and is mostly in keeping with the sensitivity of sentinel node dissection in breast cancer using a single agent, for example, but overall not at the level required to make sentinel node dissection relevant to daily practice. In fact, the Japanese clinical oncology group, study number 0302, was prematurely terminated due to an unacceptably high rate of false negative sentinel nodes using the pickup method. But why is the pickup method of sentinel lymph nodes so good for breast cancer, yet so poor in gastric cancer? The answer lies in some inherent aspects of gastric anatomy and gastric cancer pathophysiology. The lymphatic drainage of the stomach is complex and unpredictable. The blood supply of the stomach is extensive, facilitating the presence of skip metastases in 5 to 10 percent of cases. Lymphatic channel clogging occurs, particularly for advanced cancer. And uh, the unclear signif significance of micrometastases is also an important issue. This is in addition to the uh, inaccuracies of intraoperative frozen section of nodes with a sensitivity as low as 70% in some studies. For all of these reasons, the pickup method is not readily applicable in the real world setting. Which brings, up, which brings us to the basin method of sentinel node dissection. Orig originally described by Miwa in 2003, this includes removal of nodes in a particular basin rather than individual nodes. The nodes in this complete basin can then be assessed either by frozen or permanent section. If positive for metastatic disease, a completion gastrectomy and lymphadenectomy can be performed either at the index operation or at a subsequent operation respectively. The benefit of this technique is that it decreases the likelihood of missed positive nodes and provides somewhat of a margin of error, so to speak. This basin concept has been studied extensively. In a prospective multicenter study performed by the Japanese Society of Sentinel Node Navigation Surgery, they looked at early stage gastric cancer, T1 or T2 cancers, that were less than four centimeters. They used a dual tracer, me dual tracer method with radio labeled tin colloid and blue dye. 
the sentinel basin was identified and then all patients had a comprehensive D2 lymphadenectomy. They found that of the 397 patients who were included in the analysis, the sentinel node det detection rate was 97.5%. And of the four false negative cases on final pathology, three of them were T2 or tumors greater than four centimeters. They concluded that the endoscopic dual tracer method for sentinel node biopsy, biopsy was safe and effective when applied to the superficial, relatively small gastric adenocarcinomas included in their study. Finally, the much-awaited Korean Senorita trial has begun to report their results. The Senorita trial, or the Sentinel Node Oriented Tailored Approach trial, was an open-label, multi-institutional, parallel-assigned, non-inferiority, randomized control trial comparing standard of care gastrectomy and lymphadenectomy to organ preservation surgery combined with sentinel node basin dissection. Importantly, because many previous studies had been criticized for lack of standardization and included centers with inadequate techno technical experience, all institutions in the Senorita study were required to use a standardized technique, complete quality control trial, and overcome the learning curve with a minimum of 10 cases. Inclusion criteria in that study was that patients needed to be between 20 and 80 years old, have a tumor of T1 or T2, and no nodes seen preoperatively. Uh, the tumor had to be less than three centimeters in largest diameter, and they had to not be candidates for ESD, um, so which by, by their definition was tumors less than two centimeters with differentiated histology. So basically they were only looking at tumors uh, two to three centimeters in size and T1 or T2 cancers. And the tumor also had to be located greater than two centimeters from the pylorus and the cardia. Um, they used a dual tracer method. They used ICG and technetium radio labeled human albumin. Uh, they used an endoscopic in injection. They used frozen H and E evaluation. Uh, and for patients in the sentinel group and with negative basin nodes, uh, an organ preservation was attempted. If the if the basin nodes were positive, they would convert them to a standard gastrectomy and lymphadenectomy. Options for organ preservation included ESD, endoscopic full thickness resection, Wedge resection, and segmental resections. Just this month, the first paper describing some of the results of the Senorita trial have been released. In this study, published in BJS, the Korean group looked at short-term 30-day morbidity and mortality of the two groups. They found that 9% of the patients undergoing standard gastrectomy and 12.8% of patients undergoing sentinel node dissection with organ preservation had positive nodes which was not, not statistically significant. Uh, Post-operative complications, though, occurred in 19 and 15.5% of subjects, respectively, with severe complications occurring in 5.9 and 5% of cases, respectively, neither of which was st statistically significant either. They concluded, concluded that the rate and severity of complications following sentinel node navigation surgery with organ preservation are as comparable to those of standard gastrectomy, which is somewhat of a disappointing outcome being that they did not show any improved uh, complication rate, even though they were performing a, a organ preservation and less significant operation. We are still awaiting the results of the three-year disease-free survival, which was the primary endpoint actually, and also data on postoperative quality of life, both of which are needed before any statement can be made regarding whether organ preservation with sentinel node basin dissection is a worthwhile pursuit. We also await the results of the Senorita II trial, which is looking at sentinel node plus endoscopic resections. While these studies are very important in defining the role of sentinel nodes in gastric cancer, these studies focused on a very tight and narrow indication for the use of sentinel node dissection. Namely, they looked at only patients with early stage gastric cancer with very small tumors. These, of course, are far rarer in the Western world. The primary reasons for this are we do not currently have a screening program. Eastern gastroenterologists have a much lower threshold than their Western counterparts for performing EGDs. Uh, leading to missed opportunities to identify these cancers early on when they are most amenable to minimally invasive interventions. Until now, we've been discussing the underpinnings and indication for sentinel node dissection in gastric cancer in general, but let's turn our attention towards the identification modality and the potential that new modalities and technologies open up for us. For the most part, studies to date have either used a radioisotope and or a visible dye, such as blue dye or ICG. Again, ICG used as a visible dye. Um, there are multiple shortcomings of each method, including the cost and difficult handing, handling properties of radioisotopes, also the technical aspects of using it laparoscopically. On the other hand, color dyes may be cheap and readily available, 
but are often vis difficult to visualize through fat, especially in our Western patients who, are, who have significant obesity. They're also associated with side effects, specifically the blue dyes. A better sensitive no modality is needed, one that is readily accessible, cost-effective, and easier to use and handle. This paper, published in Surgical Endoscopy, was a meta-analysis looking at the use of ICG and fluorescence imaging for sentinel node identification. They looked at 10 studies in 643 patients and found a pooled identification rate, sensitivity, and specificity of 99, 87, and 100% respectively. And although this was looking at the, pet, pet and, at the pickup method mainly, it supports the increasing recognition of the value of ICG and fluorescence imaging in sentinel node identification. But how about thinking of ICG in another way entirely? What about looking at ICG as a method of identifying lymphatic drainage pathways and tracts rather than individual nodes? Using the fact that ICG can be picked up in the nodes for up to three days post in injection, Sianchi et al. looked at the mean total number of harvested lymph nodes between a group using ICG and a control group without ICG. Both groups underwent robotic gastrectomies and used the Firefly fluorescence imaging system. They found that there were significantly more harvested nodes in the ICG group than the control group. They concluded that near infrared imaging with ICG may provide additional node detection during robotic surgery for gastric cancer. Now, they did concede that this difference may have been related just to improved identification of the nodes by the pathologist, but based on my experience and our experience here in Maimonides, there is clearly improved identification of lymph nodes and tracts during dissection, and this is a vital factor in involving lymph node yield. This is particularly true when using a system that provides a fused white light and fluorescent view. This augmented visualization directs your dissection in a way basic anatomical landmarks cannot. And while this improvement is going to be subtle, as more surgeons take advantage of this technology, its benefits will become more apparent. Uh, sorry, I seem to have lost my video and my slides are stuck. I am sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, I chose this video uh, just uh, because it, it highlights really nicely um, how well the lymphatics can be visualized. As you can see, this is obviously a more advanced tumor. This patient actually got neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, but um, again, this just highlights how easy it is and, uh, to visualize the lymphatics channels and the, the lymph nodes uh, using this modality. And again, even more importantly, the ease of dissection while using the fluorescence imaging as an augmentation of your vision. I picked this video uh, to highlight another point. Um, this is a patient with a, uh, with a much lower stage uh, tumor. Um, this was uh, tattooed previously by the gastroenterologist, injected endoscopically, which is our standard. Um, and you can very rapidly, within, within a matter of minutes, see the, uh, uh, the fluorescence in the lymphatic tracts. And you can see this draining to the uh, right gastroploic basin. And again, it's very, very, very clear. And you can see clearly here the, this first draining lymph node uh, and then the subsequent tracts that are extending out uh, to the right lateral. Now, again, what's, what's very clear here is, first of all, look at this panel. This is the standard uh, fluorescence panel that, that the computer is actually getting. And these are the fused images in the center. Um, you can see clearly the lymphatics. But you can't operate while using that, but the fused images you can. And more importantly, if you just look at the dyed color of the ICG, all you see are these lymphatic tracts. But with the fluorescence overlay, you can clearly see the lymph node uh, up here and, it, and, and much more clearly all the rest of the tracts. Uh, so again, just highlighting that benefit of uh, the fluorescence overlay imaging. In light of, what, of all of what we've been discussing, and to take this even one step further, what if we think about fluorescence-assisted nodal identification as simply a way to avoid a complete D2 lymphadenectomy for every tumor regardless of its drainage pattern? Let me pose the question like this. 
A tumor that drains primarily to the hepatic and portal basins should not need stations 11 and 10, the splenic artery and splenic hyaline lymph nodes resected. Or lesions dra draining primarily through the celiac with no drainage to the hepatic artery basin should not require station 12, the hepatoduodenal li ligament lymph nodes resected. Is there a way to tailor our, our approach so as to optimize the lymphadenectomy we are performing? I believe that the solution lies in fluorescence guided lymphadenectomy. And I will take this even one step further and say that this could even apply to patients with more advanced cancer. This would then become particularly relevant to Western surgeons who are seeing these higher stage tumors and specifically not wanting to do excessive and likely unnecessary lymphadenectomy, specifically in the highest risk locations. I believe that fluorescence lymphangiography can help provide that guidance. With the use of a fluorophore and a combined imaging system, this technique is very easily standardized and reproduced. Although I routinely do D2 lymphadenectomies, I have been looking at this option carefully, and I'm very optimistic about the potential of this technique. So in summary, sentinel node dissection plays an important role, an important but evolving role in the modern treatment of early gastric cancer. I remain highly optimistic regarding the value of this technology in the treatment of gastric cancer patients. And we look forward to the results of an ISFGS supported Delphi study regarding the use of fluorescence imaging for sentinel node dissection in gastric cancer to inform ongoing clinical studies and tre treatment algorithms. I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great insight, Dr. Sherwinter. Um, before we get started with the already incoming questions, um, just a reminder, you can still submit your questions through that questions pane in your right-hand side. And first question we had coming in is, what do you think are the barriers to lymphangiography for most surgeons? Mm. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a great question. Uh, so um, the barriers, I, I think, technical is, is a large aspect of it. You know, firstly, like I mentioned earlier, I think that, you know, using a radio collar is extremely difficult for most surgeons. You know, the access, the handling, the cost, um, very, very difficult. And that really prevents any kind of dual tracer method, I would say. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important to develop single tracer methods that are just easy to manage, easy to handle. Um, so the first barrier I would say is definitely most surgeons do not have access to a dual tracer method, number one. Number two, just technically, you know, in the injection, uh, endoscopic injection, you know, some surgeons are not even facile with endoscopy, but even those who are uh, injecting in the correct plane and getting good flow to the lymphatics is difficult. In fact, uh, in the Senorita trial, that was some of the first steps is proving the ability uh, to, to inject without contaminating the abdominal cavity, um, without with getting into the correct plane, uh, not just injecting it into the lumen, which also is a contaminant. Um, you know, so all of those uh, degrees of technical dif difficulty definitely add to it. And if using a colored dye or using, again, a radioisotope, using the technology to identify the nodes or being able to visually identify the nodes is extremely difficult. Uh, and really, that's where I see the huge benefit of ICG and fluorescence imaging, you know, the, where you saw in those videos that identifying those lymph nodes is just so easily done. And again, I just to like to reiterate, using a combined modality visualization system is so important because it gives you the ability to dissect while you're visualizing you know, with augmented vision, the uh, the lymph nodes and the lymphatic tracts. Thank you. Next question we had coming in is, what role does the ISFGS and other international societies play in furthering the acceptance of sentinel node dissection in gastric cancer? Right. So. I, I definitely think that uh, that uh, societies, especially international societies, uh, are important in bringing together uh, disparate experience and disparate um, uh, uh, feelings about this. You know, particularly, uh, although in the West we we're, we're have a have a great interest in doing uh, more advanced lymphadenectomies and sentinel node dissection, by far, by far and away, by by orders of magnitude. The experience in Korea, the experience in Japan, the experience in the East are, are just so much more dramatically better. And you know, they're bringing everyone together 
uh, to join in a consensus, I think is extremely important and requires these international societies to do so, and also be a clearinghouse for just all the information. Uh, you know, the Delphi uh, studies that have been published so far by the ISFGS uh, and the upcoming one on Sentinel nodes specifically for gastric cancer, I think are going to be very important in informing uh, studies going forward, what the information is out there, and just making sure everyone's pretty much on the same page about what's already been done, what needs to get done, and what information do we need to bring this to, to the general surgeon out in the community. Thank you. Next question we have is, when is the dye injected? When is dye injected? So, uh, so again, in, in the dual tracer methods and with uh, using radioisotopes, uh, it, it's diff it differs. Uh, it differs between the different studies that were done. Um, for, for ICG, though, we inject it, uh, it immediately intraoperatively. So it, it immediately, once we gain access to the abdominal cavity, our trocars are in, uh, we immediately uh, start uh, our injection. Uh, schema. Um, we do the four-point injection uh, uh, of uh, about 0.5 cc's in all four quadrants around the tumor. And, you know, again, the beauty of ICG is basically you immediately start seeing the flow. Uh, and depending on how far you want to watch the, the lymphatic flow, it depends on how long you have to wait, but it, it practically flows before your eyes. It's pretty, pretty incredible to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, as you saw, one of the studies that I put up there, which was quite interesting, uh, from Italy, uh, they, they were doing it days beforehand, the, injecting the ICG days beforehand. But again, uh, if you're just looking for the lymphatic tracts, as I was just describing at the end, it could be done really just at the beginning of the operation, you know, which, which again is another value. One, you know, another barrier would be if we're requiring surgeons to bring patients in a few days before, do an endoscopy, and then a few days later uh, bring them in for surgery at, at another sitting, you know, that's another layer of complexity and difficulty with scheduling and difficulty with, difficulty with availability of ORs, availability of uh, endoscopy suites. Uh, if this can all be done at one sitting while the patient's under anesthesia, you do the endoscopy, you identify the tumor, you know, all of that as one, as one package, I think it's just much, much easier for, for, the, uh, for the patients and the surgeons. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions going into the same direction about what is the recommended injection technique using ICG and amount, timing, and any tips you can give? Right. So, so again, uh, you know, it's, we do it only endoscopically. We do not do any transserosal injection. My experience with that has been extremely bad. Um, basically, every time I've tried that, I've contaminated the abdominal cavity. And ICG is so sensitive that if any ICG gets onto the instruments, gets onto anything, it will contaminate any, uh, the, it will look like you have lymphatic tracts everywhere when in fact you, it's just contamination. So transserosal, in other words, like laparoscopically, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's even an option. I haven't been successful with it. If someone else has, I'd be, I'd love to see how. Um, so we've been doing this only endoscopically. Uh, it's, it's submucosal injection. Again, it's about 0.5 cc's times four injections um, uh, in, uh, around the tumor. Um, and I would definitely recommend that in the early part of your learning curve, we, and this is the way we did it, um, to do it under laparoscopic visualization. So in other words, mobilize the, the greater curve, divide, divide the omentum, get into the lesser sac so you can visualize the, the entire uh, four quadrants that you're going to be injecting into, um, and then inject basically under direct vision to ensure that you're not putting the needle uh, through the, uh, through, through entirely through the full thickness of the wall. And again, you know, obviously if you have extensive endoscopic experience where you're injecting uh, lesions routinely and, you know, doing EMRs and ESDs yourself, obviously you don't need that. I, I do not do EMRs or ESDs myself. That That is in the purview of the gastroenterologist in my institution. Um, so I had to really learn how to do these injections and that's the way I did it. So try, do it under direct vision, make sure you're getting a feel for where that endosco where that uh, submucosal pop is so you can get into the right plane, inject without over injecting. Uh, we found that if you end up injecting and it spills into the, in, even intraluminally, it's a problem. So you really wanna be very tight, very, very, very tight about those injections. Uh, and, and again, you know, four, four quadrant um, and submucosal endoscopic in injection is, is definitely my, my way to go and definitely what I'd recommend. 
Thank you. Another question we had coming in is, are most surgeons doing a complete D2 lymph lymphadene ictom ictomy? And if not, why? Right. That that that's a that's a very good point. Um, you know what what what's interesting is that I, I think that you know uh, again back to the Korean model. Um, in order to be part of the Senorita trial, uh, for example, um, you know surgeons had to. Uh, uh, had to prove that they were able to do a full D2 lymphadenectomy. Um, and in Korea, they have a, a full system where uh, they have you know, videos need to be submitted uh, and uh, these are evaluated by, by experts. And, um, you know, I think that, that you know, the, these kind of systems are lacking here in the United States. So I think that a lot of people that perhaps think they're doing D2 lymphadenectomy are not necessarily uh, getting the kind of lymph node clearance that they think they are. Uh, you know, again, back to the fluorescence uh, uh, lymphangiography, I think that ICG does help with that. And if you're doing your dissection and you see some further, you know, ICG positive tissue, you know, let's say, for example, in the posterior superior aspect of the pancreas, for example, you know, it indicates to to, to you as you're learning, um, and even even further along on your learning curve, that there may be more lymphatic tissue that you you haven't accessed yet. Uh, you know, that that's as an example. But I, I think that that I think most surgeons just get nervous as they dissect out into into pretty pretty dangerous areas. Uh, they get nervous doing that laparoscopically. And again, I think most most surgeons would like to do the minimally invasive technique. Most surgeons are moving towards laparoscopy for gastrectomies or robotics for gastrectomies. Uh, and because of that, uh, dissecting out into the splenic hilum, dissecting into the porta hepatis, I think poses some, some, uh, some fear uh, for surgeons and they kind of you know, tone it down a little as they get out there laterally. And I definitely find that for myself. Um, you know, and again, uh, I think that, uh, using ICG and, and fluorescence imaging to, to help your dissection, to, to inform which basins are really, should you concentrate on, I think will give Western surgeons definitely the confidence to say, if I'm working out into the splenic hilum, I'm doing that for good reason. And it's worth taking the extra time and the extra effort to work out towards the splenic hilum. But in this patient, I don't need, for example, to work into the porta hepatis. Or if I'm working in the porta hepatis, it's because this tumor drains in that direction. And that's and that's why I'm work, working on that. But I can leave the splenic hilum alone. I think that it, the D1 plus of using fluorescence imaging, I think, will be much more informed and much more, uh, you know, much more directed. Uh, so I think that really this brings a D2 light almost to most surgeons out there versus now I think that most surgeons really do not feel comfortable, especially, you know, particularly in the Western world. I think most surgeons don't feel comfortable doing the D2. And I think even many that have not gotten specific training in the D2 are not really doing a D2. They're doing a D1 plus really. Thank you. Next question we have is, do we need to submit all the green notes for frozen? Oh, what? I, I missed that. Uh, all the green notes for green notes. for frozen. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, um, the way we're doing it is that we're not doing any any frozen. We're not doing any intraoperative uh, frozen sections. We have not been doing that. Uh, you know, it, uh, again, if you're doing if your intent is to do some type of pickup method for sentinel nodes, which again is is completely uh, a, um, uh, a, uh, experimental at this point. And even if you're doing basin nodes and you're submitting those for frozen, uh, you'd be submitting all the basin nodes. In other words, not just necessarily green nodes, but also all the, all the ones in the basin that are, that are, that are basically outlined by the lymphatic tracts and the lymph nodes, um, that are basically medial, uh, uh, medial to the nodes. And that is lateral to, let's say, you know, the, 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 the gastric wall. Um, so if you're doing, if you're doing, uh, something under IRB guidance for either, whether that be basin dissection, whether that be sentinel node dissection, uh, then, you know, you have to, you, you have to base it on what that IRB would be. So for sentinel nodes, yes, I guess it would be frozen for basin. You'd, you'd choose wh which schema you'd want to pick. Uh, but myself, again, I'm not, I'm not doing any kind of sentinel node or basin nodes. We are doing a complete D2, uh, dissection, uh, for all patients. Uh, but again, we've been looking we've been looking retrospectively at whether the added D2 in basins that were not green and had no tracks 
were of any benefit to the patient and did they show any nodes? We've been looking at, at that retrospectively. Thank you. Does the technicality of the injection scheme beget the use of 3D endoscopy? Uh, repeat the question. Does the technicality of the injection scheme beget the use of 3D endoscopy? Uh, so I think what, what, what you're asking is, does 3D endoscopy improve the ability to inject endoscopically? I can't answer that question. I've never used 3D endoscopy. I've never seen that. Um, so I, I can't really answer that question. As far as 3D laparoscopy, if you're referring to uh, using the Da Vinci 3D imaging or some of the other other companies 3D imaging, um, it definitely 3D imaging does improve your ability to dissect and the you know f uh, fineness of the dissection of the robot may help uh, with uh, with lymph node dissection. Uh, I, I will uh, concede that, um, but overall, you know this the, the lymph node dissection can be done robotically, it can be done laparoscopically, whichever modality you feel most comfortable with. Thank you. Maybe time for one last question. And this is, I am doing robotic gastrectomy for gastric cancer. How do you think this works with Firefly? Because visualization with pinpoint, I think is superior. Right, that's actually, that, that's exactly, thank you for asking that. That's exactly what I was getting at. Um, you know, I, I am a, a big fan of the pinpoint. And uh, again, I, I don't really understand why Da Vinci shows the Firefly system uh, without real true white light, full color image. Um, so basically for those who are not familiar, the Firefly system, which is on the DaVinci robot, has a fluorescence imaging mode, and it shows the fluorescence overlay onto a, uh, a regular image, but that regular image is black and white. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's a very dark black and white image. It's very difficult to operate in the Firefly mode, even though you can see some anatomical landmarks and you can see the fluorescence. The pinpoint system, on the other hand, and there are other companies now that make a similar kind of system, um, but you know we have pinpoint in my hospital, so that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, the pinpoint system gives you a full color, high definition laparoscopic image that you're used to, that you saw in my videos, plus an overlay of fluorescence. And at some point, Da Vinci chose to go to the black and white versus the pinpoint color. And I'm not sure why they're made. The, the systems were made by the same company, so I still to this day have no idea why they chose that. And that exactly gets to the heart of the matter: is that although the fluorescence that you see on the Firefly is quite good, it, it's still pretty difficult to operate in real time with the Firefly mode on. And what people will do is they always say to me, "Oh well, I, I just click it on and off with with my foot, or there's there's a, a another another button that you can that you can adapt to it," uh, but you know, my answer to them is why would you want to turn it on and off when you can operate the whole time in fluorescent mode and you're actively in real time augmenting your vision uh, and improving your surgical technique? You know, why would you choose to click it on and off when you have it full time? Uh, so I don't really, I don't, I don't really know why they did that. And, you know, again, for people who are experienced with the Firefly and the Firefly, you know, they're used to it. That's great. It definitely gives you an excellent fluorescence and it definitely can be used for what I've described it as. But, you should take a look at the pinpoint and, and see how, how much how much better that view is and how much easier it is to operate with that with that running. But thank you for that question. Thank you. Anything you want to add before we close today's event? Uh, no, I, the last thing I would add is just I would encourage everyone listening to uh, join the ISFGS um, to become members and uh, to throw your weight and support behind it. Uh, I'm sure there are many people on this call that that have uh, more experience than I, than I do in uh, gastric cancer surgery uh, and uh, uh, joining and being part of the Delphi study, for example, and, and just helping us uh, with direction, I think would be great. And uh, we, we'd love to have you as, as members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherwinter. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you least leave today's event, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with the link to view recording of today's event. On behalf of International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery with grant funding from Diagnostic Green and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.